Welcome to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, home of high steel structures, one of the largest structural steel fabricators in the United States. Over the past nine decades, the company has produced steel superstructures for thousands of bridges, including some of the most iconic structures in the nation. The company also supplies building girders and weldments for construction and industrial applications. Join us as we take a trip around High Steel, following the fabrication of girders in various parts. We start our tour in the yard outside the primary facility, Plant 2. We'll check out Plant 1 later on in the tour. Can you spot the railway? Rail cars bring in material to the plant every day. Travel lifts transfer the material to a truck that brings it to a designated spot in the yard. At our first stop inside Plant 2, you will see a plate processor. The plate processor cuts, marks, and drills holes in the plate. The machine can cut using plasma or gas. Plasma is the preferred method, but is generally only effective for steel that is up to 2 inches thick. See the water in the table? The water captures the smoke and helps reduce noise while the plate is being cut. After the plate has been processed, welders join parent plates together in a process called butt splicing. This team member is splicing the web using submerged arc welding, which we'll explore later on in the tour. You'll notice the welding is mechanized using a gantry. The weld machine moves across the plates, filling the groove. Once the groove is welded and the flux is cleaned out, the machine comes back for another pass until the groove is completely filled. Then the plate is turned over, the root of the weld is back gouged, which we'll see later, and the back side of the weld is filled. Grab your earplugs, it might get loud. Aside from hammers hitting steel, back gouging is the loudest process at the plant. Back gouging is the removal of weld metal and base metal from the back side of a joint to prepare it for subsequent welding. Once the welding is complete, it's time to remove the weld reinforcement. This teammate is grinding off the reinforcement to get a nice finished surface. Removing the reinforcement is not typical in structures, but it is very common in bridges to facilitate good fatigue performance and tension splices and also to facilitate testing. Now it's time for quality control. Here, a technician conducts ultrasonic testing using a machine that sends sound through the web splice. If there's a defect in the weld, the sound will reflect off it. This reflection will show up on the machine. The technician will then document the defect in a report and also mark the steel to make it clear to the welder where repairs are needed. At our next stop, a machine runs up the middle of a flange, removing mill scale. The flange must be cleaned in the area where the web will be attached. It is not always necessary to remove mill scale for welding, but the bridge welding code requires this removal for web to flange welds. The flange material is on the move. Cranes are transporting these spliced flanges to a table where the girder will be built. You can spot a girder that's almost ready for a flange behind the moving material. You'll notice the plate has some give and movement. We often think about steel as stiff, but it is actually quite flexible, which is why we can build steel bridges so readily. When girders go up in erection, a certain amount of pulling, pushing, and twisting is needed to get the steel to fit and this is possible given steel's flexibility. There are a few ways to build a girder. Let's take a look at the older method first. Here we have a web held fast to the flange. On the far side of the girder, a worker hammers the web into position. Once it's in the right spot, the other teammate tacks it in place. 
High Steel uses this older girder building process for girders like this haunch girder that will not fit in the mechanized gantry we will see soon. We just mentioned tacking. You can see those tacks at the bottom flange to web connection here. Now we're taking a look at overhead tacking to attach the top flange to the girder web. Note that they are tacking the flange to the web using gas metal arc welding. Here, you'll see the newer method of building girders using a machine. To build the girders, webs are set on the supports and flanges are brought to the machine called a girder builder. The machine squeezes the flanges tightly to the web to produce a good fit and then tacks them in place. You can see the equipment move its way along the girder, pushing the plates together. Every now and then, you can see the tacking where there's a glow of the weld arc. Let's talk about submerged arc welding. Here, a team member makes the final pass of the web to flange weld using submerged arc welding, a non-open arc process in which flux, or powder, shields the arc. A preheating torch produces the bright glow you see and travels with the welding equipment ahead of the weld arc. Submerged arc welding does not produce a bright arc and the welder does not need a shield for eye protection from the light of the arc. Time to drill the girder for field splices. An operator in the white booth runs a program that operates the gantry to drill the girder. In this case, both the top and bottom flanges are drilled at the same time. You can also see the installation of stiffeners in this scene. Look for the red cart. Here, a team uses jacks to push apart flange, drop in stiffeners, and tack them in place. Earlier, we saw the stiffeners being placed. Here, welding equipment, called a dart welder, uses submerged arc welding to weld the stiffeners to the girder. As the equipment works its way across the length of the stiffener, the worker clears the slag from the weld, checks the weld in progress in case any setting adjustments are needed, and vacuums the excess flux, which is filtered and goes to the top of the hopper and eventually comes back down for reuse. Let's step back out in the yard for a moment. This is where assembly happens. Sometimes assembly is used to check the fit of members. Other times drilling is done or partially done in assembly. On to plant one. In the 1950s, the highs moved out of downtown Lancaster to build plant one. High Steel made all beams here for 15 years until bridges got bigger and outgrew it. Now, this is where High Steel produces the smaller stuff. Plant 1 also has a plate processor that cuts, marks, and drills. Thicker plates usually wouldn't be cut here. This plasma cutter is cutting detail parts that will eventually go to the main shop where they will be installed on a girder. Girders can be straight or curved. Sometimes the girders need adjustments for more or less curve. These two people are conducting sweet peak correction to introduce that curve. They're making a V-heat pattern on the flange. That portion of the flange expands and when it cools, it shrinks down, changing the curvature of the girder. Can you see where the steel is dry and where it is moist? Whenever steel is heated, it appears to sweat. This is because moisture in the exhaust gases from the torches accumulates on the cooler steel. The moisture doesn't adhere where it's hot, but as you move away from the heated steel, you can see it has adhered to the cooler steel. Often in the shop, you can see moisture or even puddles on the steel and can tell that it has recently been heated. Beams are cambered in this area of the facility. Cambering is the intentional act of creating an upward curvature in the beam. On plate girders, camber is cut into the web on the plate processor we saw earlier, but this is not the case when rolled beams are used as stringers. On the smaller beam, you can see heat marks where heat was used to introduce camber. 
Small beams can also be cold cambered on the green table. Jack spin the beam and cold cambering. Meet the wheel abrader, a glass cabinet for girders and bigger parts. If you look at the floor, you can see a chain that crawls forward very slowly, transporting the girder through the cabinet. The cabinet blast shot to clean the steel of mill scale, rust, and other impurities. It also creates an anchor pattern, making a rough surface that helps paint adhere. Time to paint the girders. Usually painters apply multiple coats, including the primer, intermediate coat, and top coat in any number of colors. This is the top coat. Before the girder heads to its last stop, the paint needs to cure. Not all bridges are painted. Instead, some are made of weathering steel, as we'll see later. The machine here processes smaller parts, like those for cross frames. A worker is currently grinding an angle, getting parts ready for building the cross frames. Team members fill the cross frames in this area of the shop. They have tables that provide guides for setting the gusset plates and angles to properly build the cross frame shape. The screen in the back displays a shop drawing with instructions to build the cross frame. Once the cross frame is built, it is welded using submerged arc welding. It's not shown here, but High Steel also uses gas metal arc welding for welding cross frames. The machine indicated here is a press brake. The worker puts dimensions on the plate and installs it in the press brake, which creates a small bend in the plate. Such bent plates are used in cross frames, lateral braces, and other smaller components where a bent plate is needed. Cross frames, plates, and other smaller parts go through this blast cleaner. You can barely see the movement, but this table keeps the product going forward while the machine is still blast cleaning. These plates have a slight bend in them produced by the press brake we just saw. Painters coat miscellaneous parts, such as cross frames and diaphragms, in this bay before the steel moves on to its next destination. At our final stop, the girders have been loaded onto the trucks and are headed off to become a part of the next great steel bridge. These girders are not painted, but instead are made of weathering steel. Weathering steel protects the bridge from corrosion by forming a protective oxide layer, or patina, on the steel's surface. This patina protects the steel from further corrosion. Thank you for joining our tour of High Steel Structures. To learn more about High Steel, please visit highsteel.com. For more virtual tours, check out AISC.org slash VR.